Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the seminar series of the Institute of Applied Computational Science. Today, we have a, a great pleasure to introduce um, a, a former Harvard PhD student, uh, Lor Zana, who is a professor in mathematics and atmosphere ocean science at the Quran Institute uh, in uh, New York University. Lor uh, got her PhD in 2009 in climate dynamics. I believe her advisor was uh, Ellie. Ellie Chipperman, and before that, uh, she did uh, her uh, studies at the Tel Aviv University and at the Wiseman Institute in, um, in Israel. Uh, the research of Zana is quite exciting, is that the, the thing that everybody is concerned about today is on, on climate. Um, so she's looking on the dynamics of the climate system. And the main emphasis of your work is to study the influence of the ocean on the local and the uh, global um, scales. Um, I should also mention that before uh, going to NYU, um, she was a faculty member of the University of Oxford uh, until 2019. And, and um, today she's uh, uh, leading several activities. She's the lead PI in the NSF NOAA uh, team on um, climate process team on ocean transport and eddy energy. Um, this and there is also an international effort to improve climate models with scientific machine learning, the M2 LI NES. Or I presume we were going to hear more about that um, uh, today. Lor has several awards, and I would like to mention one that uh, last year uh, she was the recipient of the Nicholas von Fonov Award for the American Meteorological Society for exceptional creativity in the development and application of new concepts in ocean and climate dynamics. Laura, thank you for agreeing to give this talk. We're looking forward to your presentation. Great, thank you very much, Petrus, and, and for, the, for the very kind introduction, and thank you everybody for joining in. I'm uh, always excited uh, to give a talk back at Harvard again. I'm always sad not to be uh, in person, but, but definitely very happy to be here. And uh, I know some of you were in the audience, Petras included, uh, a couple of weeks ago for the talk I gave in the applied math. So the kind of the thematic is, is fairly similar, meaning how can machine learning or artificial intelligence can help, um, you know, advance climate modeling or what are the challenges? Um, it was more on the applied math side uh, last month where I only talked about equation discovery. So here, I'm really gonna try to take a step back, try to think about how machine learning can help climate modeling. Uh, but also what the opportunities and challenges are. And so there will be a, a lot of deep learning uh, aspect, which I didn't touch on uh, last time around. Um, uh, as I think I was asked, I'm very happy to take questions uh, along the way. It's a lot more fun uh, to get people, um, you know, uh, people's reactions and, and especially if there are comments and questions. And so before, before I start again, the most important thing here is a lot of the work uh, has been led by my former PhD student, Tom Bolton, in Oxford who was in Oxford and now works for GitHub as a machine uh, learning engineer, and my current postdoc, Arthur Guillaume, uh, at NYU. And so they really kind of led uh, a lot of the efforts that I'm gonna talk about when we talk about uh, the oceans. Okay, so let's start with the basic concept, right? I'm gonna talk about climate modeling and to understand what climate modeling means, we need to understand what a climate model is. And so usually what we do is, um, you know, we, we start with all the processes that we have in the ocean atmosphere, land, and so on and so forth. And you can see the movie down there showing all the different pieces of the Earth system that the climate model has to simulate. And that's, you know, the, the land biosphere, that's, um, you know, the ocean, the fluid of the ocean, the thermodynamics of the atmosphere, and so on and so forth. So really capturing, uh, you know, a fast evolving, multi-scale, uh, non-linear system. And so for part of the system, we have governing equations, you know, like the Navier-Stokes for uh, the fluids of the oceans and atmosphere. We can't solve them by hand, right? So for other parts of the system, we don't really have equations. We have just approximations of them. But usually we start with a set of equations that we're gonna break uh, into pieces uh, to basically write them as a piece of code and, and we're gonna solve them on a grid. And so you have this, this um, you know, grid on the right-hand side over here over which at each grid box, so in each cell that you have here, you're actually gonna resolve those equations. And so of course, the more grid boxes you have, the more equations you need to solve, and you need to do that for the ocean, atmosphere, sea ice, and so forth. So the comput computational cost of solving those equations on a finer and finer grid, you, you can already realize will, will actually be uh, massively expensive. 
And so this is what this, you know, this kind of animation shows you. It's basically, you know, the same model, uh, the same climate model uh, from uh, the Princeton GFDL group run at three different resolutions. And so on the left, uh, you see a relatively coarse resolution model. That's actually the typical resolution of climate model these days, you know, as a horizontal grid of about 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer. And towards the far right, uh, what you have is actually a, a one tenth of a degree uh, resolution model. So 10 kilometer by 10 kilo by 10 kilometer. So much finer scale, right? And so of course you can see a lot of things happening. We're looking at the temperature fields here. So a lot more turbulence, some filaments going on along the coast, uh, you know, along, along Antarctica here. And so it's not just that it's beautiful, it's that it captures more physics, but again, it has a computational cost. Not only uh, that, you know, the, the scales are getting finer and finer, but, you know, the resolution, the, the increased resolution uh, also requires uh, basically a finer time step. And so more computationally expensive simulations run at very high resolution. So the question is, you know, can we afford to run those simulations for hundreds of years for many, you know, doing climate simulation? It's, it's almost impossible. And we can't get finer and finer scale because we're limited by the computational powers that we have. So we stuck with models as at relative coarse resolution, the ones on the left, that are a little bit, you know, more viscous, uh, have a lot less uh, scale interaction. And the question is, can we improve uh, on those models uh, that will actually capture the physics that we're missing, but you know, at low computational cost, so without increasing resolution. So, and can machine learning help us do that, right? And so, one way is that you know, an approach that many people have been doing is that can you actually speed up the computation, uh, or make it more efficient, or make it more reliable by changing the discretization, or by coming up by new, for a new way to actually have this scale interaction more efficient. And so, you know, Michael Brenner has, has, has quite a few paper uh, uh, women in Princeton as well. So there are a lot of groups that are actually tackling that approach. Can we actually have fast, can we actually improve the computation using neural nets or something else? Here, what I'm gonna talk about is a different approach is, is kind of really focusing on the way we've been doing physics for a long time, which is, can we represent the processes that are smaller than the grid box size of those coarse resolution model uh, in a way that is more faithful. And so this is what we're gonna talk about today is can we actually improve on what we call parametrization? So the representation of you know, small scale or subgrid processes that are, that are occurring below uh, the size of a grid box of a given climate model that we have today. And those processes are pretty vast, right? So that means we're talking about ocean turbulence, we're talking about clouds, we're talking about gravity waves in the atmosphere, talking about ocean ice interaction. So key processes in the climate system, both locally and globally, that actually can influence the climate at the large scale. And all those processes are not resolved in the in current climate model. So we need to find ways to represent them. So far, we've been doing it by, you know, having conceptual physical models or physical mathem or mathematical representation of them. But the question is, can machine learning help us actually capture better representation of those processes, given the amount of data that we have? either very high resolution simulations or some observations. Now, of course, it's not a given, right? This is a question. Uh, I'll show a few, you know, a few proof of concepts uh, where I will highlight where the opportunities are, but I'll also highlight where the challenges are. So we still have a long way to go to actually show that machine learning can improve those representation. And when you improve on those representation, can you actually improve climate simulations? Can, can you actually have you know, more accurate or actually better representation of uncertainty in the current generation of climate model that we have. And again, this is an open question, uh, but again, there are a lot of exciting tools and a lot of, ex and, and a lot of new and exciting data that we can you know, play with to actually try to address those questions. And that's why it's, it's pretty exciting for us that you know, it's part uh, you know, of a big new collaboration that is funded by Schmidt Futures on really kind of tackling this problem of multi-scale machine learning in couple climate models. Can we actually, come up with better representations using machine learning and physics uh, of those subgrid scale you know, parametrization and implement them in the current generation of global climate models uh, that we have from existing modeling centers around the world. And so I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit at the end. But that's the plan for today. You know, can, we, can machine learning help us uh, you know, extract better representation of those small scale processes uh, in the climate system? And, and so why do we want to do that, right? And so they're kind of trying to give you a bit of an idea of why we're after this problem is that we have many climate models out there 
and you know, and and they're phenomenal, right? Again, as I said, you know, they 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 solve the equations of motions and the governing equation for the ocean atmosphere, sea ice, and so on. But they're uncertain. And so, if we look at um, you know, if we look at this top row over here, we're looking at a range of the previous generation of climate models. Each one of the thin lines is actually highlighting uh, a given projections of precipitation in a given model. Now, the different colors are for different emission scenarios. So that, you know, we can't quite predict what we're going to do in the future. So usually we impose the few different scenarios and we look at how the different climate models will evolve. But what you can see is, of course, there is spread, right, in the projections. Uh, some of the spread is due to the fact that emissions are different. But some of the spread within the same color is just due to the fact that different models give you different answers. And if you try to understand where that uncertainty comes from, uh, so that would be the plot on the right. So what you see is that um, overall, what you end up with is if you estimate the model spread, so basically, you know, what models are doing differently that is not due to the emission scenario, or if you want to the internal viability of the model, this dominates the uncertainty. So this kind of blue. Um, kind of this blue bar uh, over here really dominates the uncertainty. So the spread in climate projection is dominated by the model uncertainty itself, even though, they, even though they solve the same kind of equation, if you want. That's the previous generation of climate model. If we look at the current generation of climate model, it's no better. Actually, the model spread now is even larger. So now we even have more uncertainty when it comes to uh, you know, precipitation that comes directly from the models, giving you different answers. And so you know, over time, even though we, you know, basically improving our climate models, the spread and so the uncertainty is not diminishing. And part of that uncertainty is due to the fact that we're not resolving uh, processes like cloud turbulence and so on and so forth, and that we only have poor representation for them. And I think, you know, this, this is kind of an important concept. Now, not all model uncertainty comes from the parameterization, but a large chunk of this comes from, you know, not appropriately representing key processes in the, in the climate system. And so again, two examples, so clouds in the atmosphere, ocean turbulence. And the way we've been doing that so far, as I mentioned before, is we you know, come up with mathematical representation of those processes. Turbulence and mixing in the ocean, we know it's gonna mix stuff around. So usually we write it down as you know, the Laplacian of something multiplied by a parameter. So that's one way that you can parameterize small scale processes as a function of the large scale flow, as a function of the resolved scale. And so that's what a parameterization is. And that's the way we represent those processes. A, a mathematical representation of what the process does as a function of the resolved scale. So I'll pose for a second if there are any questions. Okay. There is a, there is a question that has been asked by Ellie. Sure. Uh, Go ahead. Well, I can't see the chat, but somebody can. Uh, some someone asked what int variability is, and I said internal oh. variability. Indeed, thank you. Yes, so internal variability, which you can think about it as as kind of the internal clock of the model itself, its own natural variability, its own internal clock. Okay, great. Um, and so, you know. The question is, you know, can machine learning help us improve on those parameterization, right? So far, we've been doing it in the idealized kind of mathematical framework, finding a function as a function of the result, finding a representation of the, uh, as a function of the result scale. Can we do better with machine learning? So can we use the wealth of data sets uh, that we have, either from high resolution simulation or from observations, together with new algorithms, uh, right? And we have many of them, uh, you know, from you know, from machine learning and deep learning in particular, that are extremely good at capturing complex uh, features and complex patterns together. And so by combining those two, a lot of data, great algorithms that can extract um, a lot of information, can we come up with new representation of those small scale processes? There's been, you know, quite a few studies in, in, in recent years. So, you know, many of them in turbulence, in the large AD simulation type, uh, you know, aspect. So Ling is, is one of them really kind of, kind of push forward those ideas of using convolutional neural network with embedded physics to represent small scale turbulence, kind of a, a really wonderful paper. And in the atmosphere in the last 10 years, there've been quite a few groups, you know, trying to tackle this idea of, can we actually use machine learning uh, to improve on 
atmospheric convection, clouds, uh, radiation, and so on and so forth. So I'll show you just a couple of examples uh, from people um, in our team in, in M squared lines, but it's work that they've done before. So papers by Stefan Rath, Pierre, Jean, Pierre Gentin, uh, Mike Pritchard, where they actually uh, try to parameterize, well, kind of successfully use uh, you know, machine learning uh, to parameterize uh, clouds and convection. And so again, taking high resolution simulation and learning what is the missing, you know, uh, uh, what are the missing cloud processes that you need uh, to put in a coarse resolution model to actually improve the representation of clouds and then and therefore precipitation. So in those movies here, we're seeing the precipitation rates, so millimeter per day. So uh, the plot on the left is a coarse resolution model with a con conventional parameterization of clouds. The one in the middle is the high resolution simulation. Well, of course, you can see a lot more precip, uh, you know, in, in the tropics, for example. And the plot on the right is the coarse resolution uh, with their neural network parameterization plugged in. So of course, what you can see is that you actually can recover the precipitation rate uh, of the high resolution, but without having the cost of running a high resolution model anymore, because you're running at that low resolution with a neural network parameterization that only depends on the result scale. So that's, that's really kind of exciting work that they've been doing in the last few years, um, you know, looking at cloud and convection. Another exciting you know, uh, group uh, at MIT uh, with Yanni Yuval and Paulo Gorman, I've been actually thinking about the same problem, you know, atmospheric parameterization, but you know, really thinking hard about all those parameterization need to have conservation principles, right? We can't just go and input momentum and energy without bounds. Uh, you know, into a climate model, we, we actually need to conserve some properties. And so they built, um, you know, a parameterization of different, um, you know, basically of atmospheric convection for the most part, but different parts um, of the numerical schemes that actually will, at the end of the day, conserve energy within the system. And so that's, again, an exciting advance where you can recover, you know, the property of a high resolution model with a neural network parameterization embedded in the coarse resolution run while conserving energy. So again, kind of remaining true to the physics. And that's absolutely critical uh, that we actually have conservation properties. If we want to do climate change experiments, we can't have drift in our models, but we actually input um, you know, energy or mass into the system for the next 50 years. So we need to actually think very carefully about this. So for the ocean, which is what I'm going to talk about uh, you know, for the rest of the talk, um, so my group has been working uh, quite a lot on understanding how, how ocean eddies, so kind of you know, uh, turbulence on scale 10 to 100 kilometers should be parameterized using machine learning. And those are the example I'm gonna show you now. So we're gonna focus on kind of learning uh, the turbulent forcing from a high resolution simulation uh, that a coarse resolution model should have. And so this kind of plot over here is the surface velocity in an ocean model that is run at three different resolution. So on the left, it's a one twelfth of a degree. So about you know, eight kilometer by eight kilometer resolution. In the middle, uh, it's gonna be a quarter of a degree, 25 kilometer by 25 kilometer. And on the right, it's one degree. Uh, so very coarse and very viscous. And obviously you can see that there is no turbulence in that one degree uh, ocean model, but that's usually the one that we use for uh, actually for climate projections. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use some true simulations that we have that we call truth. Uh, and we're gonna diagnose what is, um, you know, basically what is the missing forcing that the coarse resolution model should have uh, as a perfect parameterization. So again, we're gonna use a high resolution simulation to diagnose that force. And so when we learn, when we basically diagnose that forcing by just kind of filtering, you know, a high resolution run, we're gonna to try to learn it. So learn it, meaning we're gonna use machine learning to come up with a representation of that, you know, missing turbulent forcing S as a function of given coarse resolution inputs. And so in our case, it's gonna be the velocity. And I'm gonna show, most of the examples I'm gonna show are gonna be using neural network. So, you know, I call them black box uh, because they are, at the end of the day, we end up with, you know, thousands of parameters, uh, you know, multiplying the input function, but we don't really know what they look like. But I'll show you a few examples with, again, you know, opportunities and challenges of what those neural nets can give us. And I'll briefly mention, you know, equation discovery, mostly because I gave a talk not too long ago. And, but I'll still mention kind of the second approach that is quite different than, than deep neural nets. 
because you know you might not capture as much of the features or as much of the skill, but actually you end up with an equation uh, where you actually you know can learn physics from it if you actually learn something right. And you know when it comes to interpretability for climate prediction, this is pretty critical that we actually learn something that we can interpret and understand. So then when we plug it into a climate model, we have confidence in our predictions, both for the current climate, but for the future as well. Um, so again, for us, this is absolutely critical uh, to have confidence in what we do. And so the last part, which I just mentioned, right, it's absolutely critical that when we implement that, that subgrid term, the model works. So the course resolution model should not be worse than what we started with, right? So we, it has to be both numerically stable, give you a good solution and something that you actually can understand. And the high bars, you need to improve upon the current state of parameterization, which have been developed for decades, while machine learning parameterization are just starting. So, so we're very much at the beginning here. And so, but those are kind of three, three critical aspects uh, that I'm gonna focus on as we move forward. Any questions about how we uh, proceed, just to make sure? There is a question by Lily Zhang. Um, uh, Lily, please. Hi, yes. Um, my question Hi. is just how much more expensive is it to run the high resolution simulation? Yeah, um, yes, I mean, so that's actually an uh, excellent question. Um, and it will depend, of course, on, you know, the type of model that we're using. But here, just to, you know, give you a sense of scale, right? So we have, if we were only thinking about, you know, the horizontal scale, so you already have a factor of, of 10, right? So that would be 10, so that would be 10 squared, just in, in terms of the horizontal resolution. Usually, you also need to increase the vertical resolution. Uh, you know, also to first order, and then you need to also change the time step. So we're really talking about orders of magnitude more. I see. Great. Thank you. Sure. I, I don't see okay. any other questions. Please go ahead. Okay. Oh, oh Andrew, Andrew Ross, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, Hi, Andrew. Hey. Um, yeah, so... Uh, I'm sort of thinking that as we're trying to learn coarse resolution information from fine resolution, um, sorry, fine resolution from coarse resolution information, sometimes it probably isn't possible to, to do that inversion problem perfectly. Sometimes there ought to be uncertainty. And I'm wondering if, if uh, as you start to incorporate that uncertainty, will your internal variability start to come closer to, to dominating on that spread of uncertainties? That's a very good question. Um, so there is definitely uncertainty because there is not a one-on-one -on -one mapping. You're absolutely right. Uh, there is no one-on-one -on -one ma mapping between the course resolution uh, and the subgrid that we're learning. So only in our program, the inversion is, is definitely not unique. Now, I'll show an example in which we actually incorporate that uncertainty in the learning by using standard deviation. So I'll show that in a couple of minutes. Now, will that become as large or or smaller than the natural viability? That's an excellent question. Definitely something we'll need to check out, um, but a bit too early on for us because we haven't done that, that, that analysis yet. That's an excellent point. Yeah, thanks. Okay, good. So I'm gonna show you a, a few examples uh, from the oceans, as I said. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use high resolutions. We're gonna coarse grain them, filter them. Uh, and we're gonna use input data, which are gonna be well, the stream function. So stream function is basically a measure of the velocity. And our output, so basically what we want the neural network to learn uh, is gonna be the subgrade forcing, so the missing forcing that the course, course resolution model should have. So in this case, you know, we had a relatively shallow uh, network, just a few layers uh, that we used. And the last function that we used again was just the mean square error. So lowly training on, uh, on the mean square error for the algorithm to actually give us the best possible prediction for the missing subgrid forcing in the momentum equation. So again, this kind of closure problem. It was pretty exciting, uh, even though again, you know, the data is extremely idealized. So you know, if you're familiar with those kind of domains, it's kind of a, a box, it's a squared box, it's got a flat bottom. It's, it's some of the kind of early idealized work uh, that we all use in, in ocean dynamics but we need to start somewhere. And so we started very simple with that. But we're extremely pleased with the results in a sense that, you know, we're able to train a network with, you know, with very little effort to some extent um, that was able to actually reproduce, um, you know, the subgrid forcing. So, you know, you have basically those kind of six panels. The one at the top is the one that we trained on. 
where we have the true forcing, the predicted forcing, and then the correlation between them in red. You can see the correlation is pretty much one everywhere, meaning that you know, off the, learner, the learning offline has been extremely you know, efficient at capturing the subgrid forcing over the entire region that we consider. Now, of course, you can point out that you know, the eastern boundary, for example, it doesn't look as good, but there's no forcing there. So you actually have nothing to capture uh, to some extent. So the correlation is poor, but there is no trouble in forcing there. What still confuses me, I have to admit, and I'm always very honest about this, is when we actually use exactly the same network to, without retraining it to test, you know, is it generalizable? Meaning if I look at a higher Reynolds number, so let's say I increase the wind or decrease the dissipation, usually the flow becomes more turbulent. Is the network that I learn still applicable to that new regime where basically I'm in a different dynamical state? And so those are the kind of the bottom panels here. And you can see that the correlation actually went up. And I still can't explain it uh, in all honesty. So really here, um, you know, we, we, what we get is, is basically improved uh, skill, at least offline, in this higher resolution run. Uh, you know, compare, uh, you know, compared to the, compared to the kind of, you know, sorry, to the more turbulent run compared to the less turbulent run. I think there are some questions. Uh, there's, there's a question yeah. by Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, is the label from, observa from observed high resolution data or simulated data? So here we're only using simulated data, right? Um, so I'm only using very idealized simulations. And so the truth is going to be the high resolution. Uh, and so to actually get the subgrid forcing in those maps, what I need to do is to filter uh, the subgrid. So sorry, filter the high resolution. Uh, and that's basically the missing forcing uh, from kind of from my data. So here, everything is simulated data, but it's offline. I haven't plugged it in into a coarse resolution model yet. So I hope I answered the question. Yeah, thanks. OK, good. Okay. Let's continue, yeah. Okay, sounds great. Um, so now that was exciting. I can't explain why it does better in highly turbulent regimes, uh, but there's one thing I know is that it didn't conserve momentum. Uh, we didn't make any constraint in there. And that's an issue, as I said, when you actually use those network, you need to actually make sure that you conserve some of the basic properties because if I take that subgrid scale parameterization, plug it into a climate model, but I have no conservation of momentum, my model is gonna drift because the velocity is going to, can increase forever or could be for energy and it can you know, continue to increase forever. So in a following paper, what we've done is we kind of rethought this, this architecture and rather than actually learning the full subgrid forcing all the way to the end, we actually learn different elements of tensor and add a fixed layer at the end that will actually take the derivative of different pieces in the tensor. So actually you end up with the divergence of a flux meaning that you globally conserved momentum. And that's something that you can impose within the architecture itself, assuming you have the right bound condition. And that's, that's really kind of important for us that we actually embed physics within the architecture themselves. We can't just have kind of, you know, free agents when we're actually basically thinking about those architecture, because we're gonna need to plug those uh, models back in there. Second thing that, you know, uh, you know that are problematics with, with kind of those ideas is that the data is extremely idealized. In the runs that I showed you, I kind of didn't tell you, but you know, I, you know, as I say, it's kind of a square domain with flat bottom, but most importantly, only consider the range which we call mesoscale to large scale. So it's a very specific dynamical regime. So now the question is the real world data is not like that. Or even in the climate, the real climate model data, it's not like that. It's a lot more complicated. And as Andrew asked earlier, there is not a one-on-one -on -one mapping between you know, the, courses, the course, kind of course input and the subgrid forcing. Uh, there is some uncertainty in that mapping. So can we capture that? So recently, we actually thought pretty hard about this. And so what we've done is we went and used data now from a couple climate model. So you know, one, of the ones that, one of the ones that I showed you earlier from the GFDL model. So it's run at one-tenth of a degree. So again, 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer and kind of resolve the scales that we're after for this kind of subgrade turbulence uh, or mesoscale forcing. So now we didn't take the entire data set to learn from, because it's actually pretty massive. Uh, and we only took a few regions. So we took a few regions that are highlighted in gray here uh, that kind of capture different turbulent regimes. 
And we asked the algorithm again, learn uh, you know, the subgrid uh, forcing, the subgrid turbulent forcing that goes into the momentum equation. Again, you know, uh, same procedure. We take the model, we coarse grain it, extract what is the missing you know, uh, tendency that we need at coarse resolution. And we ask the algorithm, you know, again, given input velocity, uh, to learn what the missing forcing is. But we wanted to include you know, some measure of uncertainty. So rather than train on mean square error, we actually decided that we wanted to train on, you know, wanted the network to learn both the mean and the standard deviation of the forcing at every single read box. So now we change our loss function by assuming that, you know, we had a normally distributed, uh, you know, PDF for the subgrid forcing. And we incorporated that in the loss function. So now the loss function is actually learning at the same time to optimize for the mean and standard deviation of the subgrid forcing. So now we have a mean and standard deviation. So you can think about it as a quantification of uncertainty of the mapping at every single grid box uh, in, in our train. So again, the input is gonna be surface velocity, but now the output uh, is gonna be basically two moments of the subgrid forcing. And again, with, with the standard deviation giving us a measure of uncertainty over here. So I'll show you some results. We trained on uh, what we call PI control, meaning that the simulation is run with a given CO2 level uh, that it was at the level of the pre-industrial state, so at 280 uh, parts per million. So again, before we, we messed up with the climate. And so we train on kind of half of the data set and validate it against the other half. Uh, and again, if you remember, we only used just a few regions to learn from. So now the question, does it generalize over the entire ocean? Uh, you know, in, in that data set. And so this is what you see here. So uh, this is the R square. Um, so basically if you have one, uh, basically if it's light, that means that we the network is performing very well at learning offline the travel enforcing. If it's red, it has very low performance. And so hopefully what you can see here is that overall, we actually get, you know, pretty good performance. So kind of capture about, you know, 70% of, of, you know, the variance almost everywhere. The places where we perform worse, or terribly, if one would say, is along Antarctica, along Greenland. So in places where actually there is ice. Um, and there are a few reasons for that, right? So over there, the interaction is quite different between the ocean atmosphere uh, and the sea ice. So the fluxes are quite different. And we only trained on regions that were away from the ice. So that's one of the, you know, that's one of the reasons. So the regimes are quite different. And so we didn't train on that. The second thing is you can see we high, we kind of you know, shaded in gray along the continents. Um, and there we didn't touch anything along the boundaries. Again, because during the coarse graining, you're missing out quite a few data points. And we actually don't know really how to deal with the boundaries yet. We have a few ideas, but it's unclear. So when you coarse grain, then when you learn and you try to apply your filter and you're stuck with a boundary, how do you deal with that? So that's one of the key challenges that we face as well how to actually calculate the subgrades when you have boundaries, and then how do you actually apply your convolutions uh, when you have boundaries. And so that's one of the key challenges that remains when you move away from those idealized domain where everything is nice and you know, you're on a Cartesian grid and you have no bathymetry. Here we have complex geometry, we're on a sphere as well, which add its own uh, twists. Um, but you know, those are some of the challenges we're facing. Nonetheless, we were kind of surprised actually that network performed that well um, you know, in that simulation. So what we tried offline as well was say, okay, you know, we train on control. Now, you know, the world is gonna warm a lot and we have simulation where you know, CO2 you know, is doubled in that same model. So can we use the same network? We're not retraining anything. We're just basically you know, at, at kind of the you know, uh, testing stage. Can we actually see if our network uh, also predicts well offline the subgrid forcing in a world where the CO2 is doubled. So again, if it's, it's kind of light, that means high performance. If it's red, it's low performance. I mean, it's kind of almost hard to, hard to distinguish if there are any differences, but they are, by the way. So the network still continues to perform very well, even though, and we tested that, the amount of turbulence changes between those two simulations, changes by about 50% uh, in some of the key regions. The network is unfazed by that. It still captures that very well. Actually does better around Antarctica and Greenland. And it's for actually sad reason is that, you know, the ice has melted. So now you actually have real ocean turbulence that is exposed and the network was actually well-trained for that. 
So we still do poorly in regions where there is a lot of ice and ice interaction, but it actually captures you know, some places better than it did before, because now it's you know, only ocean-ocean interaction rather than ocean-ice interaction. So you know, this is all nice and well, but it's all, all offline, right? That means the network can capture um, you know, subgrid processes and su subgrid turbulent processes, but does that mean that if I take that representation and plug it into a coarse resolution climate model and run it forward, would it work? Would it do better or, you know, or would it break? And so I'll show you a few examples that are extremely idealized because actually implementing that kind of things in climate model is still a, a, a big impediment. So we're gonna take a coarse resolution model, extremely idealized, again, kind of those boxes with a flat bottom and we're gonna, pro we're gonna basically integrate it forward in time with on the right hand side, our learned stochastic parameterization. And so that's gonna be the S that goes on the right hand side. So those are equations of motions, right? So DDT of U, so the momentum uh, being time stepped in time plus a deflection. So the only now term that creates the turbulence is equal to forcing and dissipation. And the S is gonna be the learned subgrid forcing. So basically our neural net that depends on the velocity on the U bars. Um, so again, no training anymore, that's it. We've got a network, we plug it in and we're letting things evolve as, as they should. Now, how do we choose S? So again, because we learned the mean and the standard deviation. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna assume that, you know, the mean is gonna be the mean value of the forcing plus the standard deviation multiplied by a white noise pattern if you want. So basically white noise at every single grid box that multiplies the standard deviation that we learn. So that gives us, you know, at every, you know, at every grid point, and I don't think we do it every time step, we do it every day, if I remember correctly, we've done a few tests. We basically have a stochastic parameterization that we propagate in time, and it gives us a measure of uncertainty. And we run that simulation quite a few times. So here I'm only plotting uh, three ensemble members, so uh, bottom left, so we have kinetic energy on the y-axis uh, versus the x-axis, that is time, and this is the integrated kinetic energy in the model itself. The blue curve is the coarse resolution as is, which is kind of 30 kilometer resolution. So you can see it has low energy compared to the runs above. The violet curve is the high resolution run. So it's running at basically seven and a half kilometer. And the other curves, uh, red, green, and orange, are the coarse resolution. So run at 30 kilometer, plus our stochastic parameterization learn from the neural nets. So run much cheaper, right? With the learned parameterization and recover the same level of energy and the same level of turbulence as a high resolution model without a computational cost. Now, of course, it's very idealized again, and I kind of you know, want to make that point, right? This is a very idealized setup, but it's kind of amazing that it actually even worked, to be perfectly honest. I'm still, I'm still shocked by it. That we learn on a very complicated model, you know, a subgrid forcing we implemented in a completely different model in a completely different setup and it worked. Um, now, why did it work? I'm still baffled by that as well. But again, shows us there are opportunities to learn from different data set and implement them and they can work. And so telling you kind of, you know, summing up where we at in terms of deep learning, in terms of pros and cons, you know, with physical constraints or without, you know, they can have really high skill. And they can generalize pretty well, right? So we've seen different dynamical regimes, different CO2 forcing, and all of that is offline. When stochastic, then they have this kind of quantification of uncertainty embedded in them. So the, you know, the, this gives us a little bit more confidence uh, when we look at them because this is the way turbulence work. There's not a one-on-one -on -one mapping for non-linear forcing. And the implementation in this very idealized case was actually stable. Now for the cons, because not everything is good, right? I still, and I told you many times, I can't interpret it. So I don't know why it's doing very well. We, we looked at feature maps and you know, the first layer, it's gonna learn the first derivative and maybe the second derivative and second layer, but after that, I, it's impossible for us to interpret. And we looked at you know, heat maps and things like this. It's, it's been quite difficult. So we, you know, we need methods to actually help us interpret what we're looking at, that there's more than just sensitivity. And that's pretty important for us. You need to embed conservation principles in there. So it's not something that's gonna come automatically. So we need to think about a way to do it within the architecture or otherwise can do it through the loss function, but that's not that sort of hard constraint. And it's not gonna work all the time because we have open boundaries in the climate system. We've got exchanges between different mediums. So we need to think about this and 
Again, it's something we, we're all scratching our head on. Implementation, I show you a, a run that was stable with the stochastic parameterization, but that's not always the case. So some of the atmospheric run that I showed you before, they actually had a lot of issues with stability. We had issues with stability when we implemented it without the stochastic part. Uh, the model went completely off rails uh, very quickly. Um, didn't actually blow up, didn't become numerically unstable, but, but it was highly unphysical. So, you know, all those things we need to think about, and this is all in an idealized settings. When you go to a real climate model, you know, all bets are off. What do you actually work? It's gonna interact with different parts of the system. Um, and how do you implement it? It's not obvious when you have, you know, thousands of parameters built into a convolutional network. How do you plug it in into our old Fortran climate models? So those are actually real challenges on, you know, many aspects from the physics all the way to the kind of software, um, you know, software engineering aspects. So I have a little bit of time, I believe. So if there are any questions on that part before I kind of, you know, move on to a second part or kind of semi-second part. Unfortunately, I cannot raise my hand. Um, You're the host. Yes, I have a question. <laughs> Uh, so when you do the uncertain quantification by imposing this mean and standard deviation, you're making the assumption that the, the output is normal, right? So isn't it a little bit not uh, expressive enough to capture, or especially if you have high dimensional data like this? Or oh, Excellent point. I actually forgot to say it. Yes, it's actually a very strong assumption. We're assuming that it's normally distributed, and we've actually plotted the residual, and we show it's not. So we definitely made an assumption because it was, you know, we needed to try because actually I don't think it's been tried before in that context. Uh, and then of course, when we plotted the residual, we saw that, you know, skew and ketosis of course were coming in quite quickly. So now we're actually thinking about ways um, to avoid having that assumption that, that we have a Gaussian distribution indeed. Yeah, excellent question. Yeah, thanks for that. Lily had also a question. Oh yeah, this was um, uh, the results from back a few slides. Okay. Um, regarding. Can, try, the, can you tell me? Yes, right here. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was just curious if um, you had tried, or if you had seen what happens when you look at neural net the neural network prediction for a lower turbulence setting than what was seen during training? Yep, thanks. Uh, we actually did try. Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, it performs a little less well. So the more turbulent it is, the better it does, which still, I have to admit, baffles me. Uh, so, you know, our only kind of, you know, possibility was that, you know, it does, you know, because we train it on regions where there is a lot of turbulence, it might actually do better than in regions where it's less turbulent because different dynamics like waves are taking over. And you know it wasn't well trained on those regimes, so that's my only hand wavy uh, explanation. Andrew, great. Uh, so I guess along those lines, is it is it possible that the inherent predictability of different phenomena changes at different turbulences? And also, um, have you evaluated sort of whether, like, when it's generalizing to a new domain, it's possible that it's sort of seeing inputs that look nothing like what it's seen before, but it's also possible that it's seeing inputs of a type that it's already seen, but just in different proportions. Um, and in that case, you might expect it to generalize well, whereas in the former, we might not. Have you, yeah, investigated that? Yeah, uh, excellent point. I think this is something we want to investigate because that was a hunch, but we never verified it. Yeah, excellent point, thanks. Okay, okay I think we should not interrupt you more, Laura. Okay, sounds good. Well, thanks everyone for your questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, please, yeah. Okay, good. So for the last part, it's actually a little bit quick, but I, I kind of, you know, I couldn't help myself to show it uh, because I really enjoy working on that these days is that, you know, I mean, you know, I've talked about deep learning now for the last 30 minutes, but the other kind of parallel approach that we've been using that I talked about, um, you know, at the applied math meeting was kind of interpretable equation discovery. So now rather than just having a very deep network, um, we're going to try to actually learn exactly the same forcing, the same subgrade forcing that we're missing from a coarse resolution model. But rather than have a deep network, we're going to actually try to learn an equation for it. Meaning we're going to give the algorithm a set of basis function, and we're going to ask the, the algorithm to prune that library of function uh, to give us the best uh, you know, set, uh, the best equation uh, with the weights that will actually represent uh, the subgrade forcing that we're missing. 
procedure is the same, right? We're going to take the high resolution run. We're going to coarse grain it, um, you know, to a coarser resolution. And now we're going to give the, a library of function to the algorithm. The algorithm is a Bayesian sparse regression. So basically it's relevant back to machine, uh, you know, uh, uh, going back to tipping. And we give about 200 functions. So the functions, of course, are calculated from the data, obviously, right? So I'm not giving it real, real, real equations, but we're calcul calculating it from the data. So we're giving it velocities, temperatures, gradients, uh, second order derivatives, you know, some non enough functions. Uh, and we also try to trick it, you know, we give it some noise patterns, try to see, you know, if, if you know, uh, we can mess, mess with it. Um, and then basically, again, what this patient, uh, you know, a spouse Bayesian regression is, is literally going to prune through that set of, of basis function and give us a representation that is done over here. It's going to be a linear combination of our basis function, so the phi multiplied by weights, because it's, again, it's Bayesian regression, the weights are assumed to be Gaussian and they have some kind of uncertainty associated with it. It will select the basis function based on a threshold uh, that we give it, uh, you know, that, that, that we're asking it, um, you know, the algorithm to actually, you know, uh, uh, go through to select those sets of function. And in this case, of course, we're, gonna, we, we're making a choice, right? After how many functions we wanna cut, you know, our expressions, you know, we cut after just a few um, you know, just a few uh, a few expressions. We could capture about you know fifty to sixty percent of the variance with just a few basis functions. I'm not going to go into the details, but you know the the weights uh, that we're multiplying that that you know some of you know functions were very close to one another. So we just you know basically took the mean uh, and assumed they were pretty close to one another, and we were able to rewrite that function as a symmetric stress tensor. Which is what, what we expect for turbulence, actually. So you know the algorithm was able so was able to actually learn the symmetric stress tensor, uh, you know overall by by literally kind of giving it that set of basis function. And so here for us, really kind of you know the the interpretable part is that we ended up with with a set of function that we could explain physically because it relates to a lot of other work that has been done by my group and others. Uh, where we show actually how the stretching and shearing of the flow uh, flux momentum in and out, uh, depending on the instabilities that you have. And so this is kind of, you know, one, one approach uh, that we went for to kind of, you know, go in parallel to the black box machine learning that becomes pretty tricky uh, to interpret at the end of the day. Now, of course, you know, we make, a, we make a criteria, right? If you only take a few function and you can rewrite it in this beautiful sense and you capture most of the variance, then that's great. But if you need, Lots of them, then you actually gain nothing over the net over the neural network. Just again, that's a show and tell. If we again plug it in into the same kind of you know system, the coarse resolution, idealized setup, plug in you know uh, machine learning, deep learning kind of parameterization versus the equation discovery, they both do quite well. Uh, so you know the orange one, sorry, no, the red one uh, is going to be the equation discovery that we found. The deep network is the pink one and the high resolution is the cyan one. So the neural net does a better job uh, than the equation discovery. And mostly because actually we had numerical uh, stability issues, which I think we fixed now. Um, but nonetheless, the advantage with the equation discovery is that we could actually explain the physics, uh, which is a lot of fun for us and, and open opportunities to actually discover something new from the data for different processes. Again, like clouds or you know waves and so on and so forth for processes we don't have. Okay, so you know I'm going to try to sum up and give you a you know a brief overview of our you know uh, M squared lines project uh, in a few seconds, and so hopefully it should be uh, should be time for questions. So you know parameterization of unresolved processes are, are going to be in demand for decades to come uh, because we need to make projections for you know hundreds of years with ensembles. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of reached the limit of what we can do with the computational powers that we have. So we're going to continue to search for subway parameterization of processes. And here the question is, you know, can machine learning help us? Can they improve on dominant knowledge uh, or not? I showed you a few examples, right, with exciting results, but also plenty of challenges ahead. So we didn't win yet. There are a lot of possibilities um, to improve climate models, but we, we still have a long road ahead. They have to be interpretable. They need to embed conservation, you know, but, you know, it, it still gives us an opportunity with new data and new algorithm to actually learn new physics, 
Can we learn something new about how the climate system works and ultimately improve climate models? And that's really kind of the goal that we have for here. And, you know, quite often in, in, you know, in different places, you know, I'm not a machine learning person, right? I'm a physicist, I'm a climate scientist by training. And so people usually have this fight, you know, oh, but if you do machine learning, you're not doing physics anymore. And so it's kind of, you know, one against the other. And I really don't see it that way. I see them as being very much complementary. I'm not going to stop doing physics because there are machine learning algorithms, uh, but I'm not going to not use machine learning algorithm because I'm a physicist. So I kind of think it's quite important to actually find this kind of combination of, of very diverse approaches so we can actually move forward. You know, the traditional and the emerging tool can help us accelerate science. Now, of course, well, you know, machine learning and AI be as transformational to climate modeling as they have been to other fields. I think it still remains an open question, but you know, I hope there are many exciting opportunities and possibilities for this to happen, and we have to explore it. And so, so you know, there are two things coming up. One is a you know a Cavi Institute for Theoretical Physics uh, on machine learning and and, and climate uh, that is coming up, and so you know that we're organizing in the fall. So it's a long program. There's part conference and part it's kind of discussion with people for weeks, and so you can still register. And that's something where we hope to bring actually people from physics and machine learning, to kind of talk to each other and try to move forward. And as Petros mentioned, so we have a new collaboration uh, funded by Shoot Futures and Squared Lines to really tackle different pieces of the climate problem. And so really it's bringing together machine learning experts, domain experts in ocean, uh, sea ice and atmosphere dynamics and climate modeling centers. So, you know, NCAR and GFDL in the US and IPSL in France, so three big modeling centers. Uh, for us to really kind of learn from data. And so we're going to rely on the Pangeo platform, which is kind of really a, a, a wonderful infrastructure um, for us to really have a, you know, a cloud unified platform over which all of our different team can really access those new data set, those high resolution simulation, where each pieces of our project can actually learn from the data, exploit that data as efficiently and as collaboratively as possible. So we can extract as much information as possible to learn those subgrid processes, to learn those kind of, you know, cloud process. So to learn uh, about cloud processes, mixing and so on and so forth. In concert, you know, with machine learning algorithms, so really kind of take the best out of both worlds, huge amount of data through the cloud platform, using machine learning algorithm to extract as much information to uh, come up with new parameterization, new representation of the subgrid scale processes that we can then ultimately plug into the current generation of climate model directly, you know, in partnership with modeling centers. And so this is really exciting for us, you know, to have this kind of really large collaborative team with completely different, uh, you know, expertise, but all absolutely crucial, um, you know, to pushing the envelope of what climate models can do and how we can use machine learning and data. And I will leave it at that. And thank you very much for the question so far. And I hope uh, I I'm, I'm happy to take more if there are any. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, for this wonderful talk. Um, I would uh, uh, suggest that uh, you please raise your hand if you have a question. Um, uh, there was a question from David Sondak earlier that I asked him to defer to this stage of the talk. So, sure. David. Hey, Laura, thanks so much for hey, the talk. Really enjoyed Thank it. You. So, I was. One, I had to step out of the room for a minute, but um, but maybe you already said this, but I was curious when you're doing the neural net stuff, you had mentioned instability possibly of putting them into, or are you thinking of um, like ill conditioning of the of the problem? If you have like a, a very well, you know, a very well-trained model, but the insta in ill conditioning of the, the RANS equations, for example. Yeah, so yeah, there are quite a few possibilities, right? So here, for example, you know, we're learning something that, is anti-viscous if you want. Um, so you keep, you know, fluxing momentum into something and if there is nothing to stop it, uh, you know, it might continue for a while. And so that can be a problem. I think that's why the stochastic approach help us because it actually has a damping feedback, so it stop it. Second aspect is, which is something that other people have seen is that, you know, you learn on very fast processes. So you might actually might learn, you know, basically the fast growing modes uh, as part of your network. And when you implement that into, a you know, into your numerical simulation, that course resolution, you might actually break the CFL criteria. Mm. But you haven't actually thought about it because, you know, we do it, we do everything offline. Mm. And so those are two possibilities. And it's always hard to know which one. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sure.
Um, there is a question from Swale. Oh, thank you. This was actually a very nice talk, uh, especially the last part where you said it's important to do machine and physics together because empiricism has had its place, right? Uh, it has always Absolutely. had its place in physics. And that's all. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I was actually wondering, I mean, you're using narrative stokes in your fluid mechanics, which is as chaotic as it gets. I'm wondering the predictions that you were showing that were very close to the truth. Do you see any improvement or degradation as you extend the prediction time, as you go longer into the future? or if you do short-term predictions? Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. So for us, we only looked at kind of long-term, right? So several years, because we were looking at the statistics of it. So we're doing quite well for the steady states. Um, we are now thinking about, again, doing different forcings, because I think that's a harder bar for us, because we're really more interested in long-range long you know, predictions um, rather than the short-term, because we want the average, you know, basically we want the climate, not the weather, if you wish. Um, and I think for us, the high bar is going to be different four cents. And, but definitely has to be explored. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Kong? Yeah, thanks. Uh, this is a great talk. Uh, just have a, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm not like, uh, I, know, I know very little about um, oceanology, but uh, as from a oh, Australian right. point of view, this is not like a, a classification uh, problem. And I just wonder like, uh, does the model work well on the pesos uh, on the boundary of the grids? Uh, so like basically, uh, I think I'm getting is, um, how do you deal with the interaction of pesos? Uh, okay, so for the boundaries, yeah, I think I'm afraid as I mentioned earlier, we are struggling with that. So yeah, it's not a classification problem, right? We're doing a regression here. And the problem is we need to do two steps. One is, you know, we take the high res and then we need to coarse grain it. And so already doing that filtering aspect when you have a boundary is already non-trivial. We are planning a Gaussian. So if you have a land point versus an ocean point, you already have a bit of an interaction that we don't know what to do with. And the second is that the term that we're learning is a flux. So it's kind of a tendency. And I mean, you know, you can think about it. It's like you basically have some fluid that might go into the wall if you parameterize it wrong. And we can't have that right because it's a solid wall. So there, we, we kind of don't know what to do, <laughs> in all honesty. Um, it, it's something that we're struggling with. We, we're thinking of you know, having two pieces within the network where you know, we embed something when we know there is a boundary, but we haven't quite figured that one out, in all honesty. So great question. Yeah. I wish I had an answer. I've been thinking about it for about a year. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, Laurie, Laurie, if I may ask, uh, uh, yeah. it would be actually related. So, so when you do turbulence, let's say turbulent channel flows or, or separated flows, and I'm talking about aerodynamics problems or turbulent flow problems, um, it seems that if you are out in the main part of the flow, um, almost anything works uh, in terms of subgrid scale modeling. So people who do large eddy simulation, mm -hmm. Uh, away from boundaries, they would use a, a dynamic Smagorinsky model Correct. and things will be okay. And in those mm -hmm. flows, uh, uh, the, the big thing or the thing that people struggle is their wall-bounded LES. And what do you mm -hmm. do with the models near the wall? Now, the question mm -hmm. is, uh, are boundaries such an important thing in um, atmospheric flows as they are in... Um, in turbulent and in separated flows? And, and in what sense actually... Yes. I mean, just to reverse the question, why, for example, just the standard Smagorinsky that works away from boundaries in turbulent simulations mm -hmm. may not work yeah. or does not, I don't know. What's yeah. the difference no, no, between great. these yeah, two domains? Great and, yeah, yeah great, great, great question. So definitely boundaries for us are, are, are definitely important. One, again, you know, you have rigid walls and things are different. So, you know, the friction that you have along the boundaries actually affects the dynamics and the vorticity budget. So that's kind of, that has a pretty big influence. And also actually the energy cascade is different. So in large scale ocean fluids, you know, when you're in the interior flow where you have strong jets, for example, you usually have a, an inverse cascade of energy. When you're along the boundary, you actually have a direct cascade of energy. So physics is actually different. And in climate model, you know, I mean, we use Smagorinsky, but Smagorinsky does one thing, which is, I mean, you know, it's kind of scale selective uh, dissipation, but again, it doesn't do the inverse cascade. And that's missing in the current generation of planet models. So we're still missing something. Uh, and that's you know, what we're trying to do here. Now, when we implemented, it still works along the boundaries, even though we didn't train it on it. 
Uh, but I think it's because we're still in a very idealized domain where we have a no flux boundary condition. So it helps um, things to stay, you know, to stay okay or to stay in check. But from a physics perspective, it's very different regimes. One where you have friction uh, and a direct kind of, you know, energy cascade along the boundary while you're in, while you're inside uh, or if away from the boundary, you have a different dynamical regime where you have an inverse cascade and, and you know, the dominance of friction is different in that case. We'd like to thank you again for a very nice talk and uh, we look forward to your success. It's important. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for joining.